Alex to stay up here. Well, I remember when my dad did this to me, he about killed me, or I about killed him, one of the two. And, uh, but uh, I'm thankful for Alex being up here. We're going to try some announcements, change it up a little bit. So Alex is going to help with the announcements. So Alex, I'm going to flip the screen. You need to talk about them. Okay. All right. Um, last week's camp fundraiser at Culver's, we raised $260. Thank you. <laughs> and the youth camp dates are June the 3rd through the 4th. Um, the juniors and the teen overnight camp. And then the teen extreme dates are June 14th through the 18th. Which ones do you go to? Uh, both. <laughs> and the ladies fellowship at 6 o'clock p.m. it is on May 7th and there will be food and games and you have to sign up from the welcome desk and and, oh, and lastly but most importantly please silence your cell phones <laughs> <laughs> Next song. And please turn in your hymn books to page 587 at Calvary. Oh, and stand. 87. was to tap Alex on the shoulder when we needed to bring the ushers down. And there's no ushers. So I messed up on that one. Do one more verse. You're just going to start right into it. We'll do that last verse. Uh, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. All right. And the ushers, you guys come on down. Amen. 
You say, that's hard, wasn't it? Uh -huh. What were you doing when you were 13, 14, 15 years old? Yeah. Huh? I was playing in the dirt. I wouldn't do anything <laughs> like that. That's tough. Well, uh, it looked like the, the storm blew some of our folks away this morning. We had so many people out of town for some reason, not really sure. And our attendance was way down on buses again today. Uh, but we did have time to spend quality time with our kids, didn't we, Miss Heather? She enjoyed it. She had 13 in, in her class last week, and so it was a little bit of a break today. And uh, one of the little girls was a real blessing today. She told Miss Heather, said, Miss Heather, even if you do wrong, Jesus still loves you. Amen. They're learning something. And uh, you pray for us, William. It's really tough. It's tough out there. And uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Amen. Trying to reach folks for Jesus. Let's pray for the offering tonight. Oh, I'm thought, am I doing it? Okay. I thought Nathan was going to do it. He was walking up here like he was going to pray. He said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lord, for these young people that are trying to serve you today. Lord, at Liberty Baptist Church, I pray you bless them in a special way because of that. And Lord, I pray that you bless the offering tonight. Lord, give us a good offering. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to your house tonight. And bless in this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. enough time to even uh, take care of the offering and go through those doors. Thank you, Kayla. We do have an extra special tonight. Uh, not maybe a, vo a vocal special, but uh, Isaiah's going to jump on the piano for us, and uh, he's going to play Here Am I. Is that the song you chose? All right. Isaiah's going to make his way over to the piano and play Here Am I, Lord, and uh, what a blessing it is to have our teens involved. Right after that, I'll come up and uh, share the word with you. Appreciate that. Appreciate all the teens getting up here, and it, it is tough. It's hard to stand in a place where you've never been and uh, just be able to put them on the spot like that. And with even the lack of, uh, with Corona and the different schedule changes and 
Uh, we haven't had a lot of youth groups. We've been trying to meet at least once a month and um, Sunday school. Just everything is just different. And just try to get the announcements out there and get the time to prepare. And uh, I'm blessed to have at least some teens that said, you know, I'm willing to stand up in the choir. I'm willing to stand up in front of, in front of the podium. I'm, I'm willing to get at the piano. And uh, I just appreciate our teens. And you see, you, we're, uh, we're losing out on some of the older ones. Hopefully they're, they're still serving God. But then the younger ones are coming up through the ranks. And it's good to see that take place. 1 John chapter 2, if you turn there with me. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, look at a popular passage of scripture here, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, and while you're finding your place there, I just, uh, I, I remember this one, sto this one story about, has nothing to do with the message, but has all to do with the teens getting up here. Uh, my dad, as, as uh, all of you have known, and I appreciate all the prayers and all the uh, cards, uh, but my dad went on to be with the Lord uh, February 1st, just unbeknownst to any, I mean, we had no clue. You never know when your time's up. And uh, uh, I remember going up to the funeral uh, and over the weekend and, and just being able to stand up in the pulpit at my dad's church. And that was the first time I stood there. My dad would always, we had, we had a big, long, I mean, it's an old century old church, a cathedral ceiling, and we were blessed to be there. My dad pastored there for over 35 years. And I remember my dad would always sit right there. He'd introduce me and always say, th I'm thankful to have my son stay in the pulpit. Growing up, I never imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing. I, I was as shy as they come. Uh, I remember growing up and, and just hiding behind my mom. And just ducking away from anybody that would even talk to me. I said, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to talk. And I remember my dad had this great idea to put together a junior choir, not even a teen choir, a junior choir. We would bust a lot of kids in, and uh, he would try to use some of them and say, okay, let's meet for choir practice. We had a choir going, and uh, we would, we we had a little set of stairs that you that you'd be able to mark, get up the uh, the platform. It was one of those old style wooden plat, I mean, real wooden. Uh, decorated all in the front, but you had one set of stairs that were movable, and so we'd, that was where our choir stood. And I remember standing there, and uh, you guys remember the song, Jesus Loves Even Me, sung as a round, uh, not Jesus Loves Even Me, Jesus Loves Me, the, the rendition of Patch the Pirate, and uh, it ends up where one person has to close it out, and I was that one person, and I didn't want to do it, and then at the end, I barely got those words out. My dad told me afterwards, I was ready for your real bass voice. I said, Dad, I'm about eight years old. I, there's no bass in this. And I was very quiet, very silent, and you couldn't even hear that I was even part of that. And the, the rest of the group handled their own, but they all looked at me, like, okay, finish it off for us, and I didn't finish it at all. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 uh, through 17. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, look at these next three, three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There's three items there, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I've done not a great deal of studying on this, but uh, I taught in a, uh, I taught Reformers Unanimous. I was the director uh, for my father-in-law for about uh, eight or nine years uh, in his church, as well as we had a, we had a medium security prison that uh, he was doing a Bible study there, and then it was just getting too tough. It was a Wednesday night. He had to finish up there, go right to church, and he said, I can't handle this, Steve. You handle it. And uh, so I did for a, lot, for a while just trying to teach Bible studies like he was doing, and then we brought the Reformers Unanimous Addictions Program, and that went through the roof over there at that prison. Actually, when we, our last visit, we went up to Ohio not a couple weeks ago, and when we were, in, when we were there, uh, my father-in-law said, hey, there's a guy that he, he just came to church, just walked through our doors for the first time. He says he remembers you from when you taught in the prison. 
And I said, I wonder who that was. And he mentioned the name. I said, I think I do remember that name. And we sat and talked. He, we, he, he set up the, the appointment. We, uh, we sat and talked. And good to know that he's been clean since October. And he's trying to get his life straight, got, trying to get back on track. But I remember teaching the Reformers Unanimous program. And there's so, so many tools that was in that program, not necessarily to, just to teach to those that are addicted. But as I often told our church, and as I off, up there, and as I often told the inmates there at the prison, this is stuff each Christian should be doing. These are Bible verses. These are Bible verses we should be memorizing. These are, these, these are principles from the Word of God that we should make part of our life so that we have to step over those to go in sin. We have to push those aside to find the world. And it's so easy to be tempted to do the wrong things. And over and over, the founder of Reformers Unanimous, Steve Carrington, would bring up these three points. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You'll see them, at least one of them, sometimes in every sin, all of them, but maybe you might just see one of them in a sin or something that you're struggling with. You're struggling with a sin, a burden, a, a heaviness, something where the Bible says, lay aside those weights that so easily beset us. And so I want to talk tonight on this, on this thought, losing is not an option. Losing is not an option. Before we uh, dig deeper into the Word of God, let's ask for His blessing uh, and His help as we open up the Word of God. He Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for our teens tonight. We thank You for their abilities to, uh, to show them and to help us have church tonight. Lord, we thank you that there's no set way to have church. And Lord, it's just where the church gathers together. And Lord, we thank you that as we started out the service singing, Seek ye first, and there are you in the midst. Lord, we just thank you for your power upon and your help upon the uh, teens. Uh, Lord, I know they were nervous. And Lord, we just thank you for helping them uh, just get over some of that and just be able to be an encouragement to those who are sitting here, those who might be watching online. Lord, we just thank you for uh, our young people. We look forward to your blessing and your help through their lives. We ask for your help now in the message. I ask that I bring out the right points I need to be bringing out. Uh, Lord, I'd stay true to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't like, we don't like losing, do we? Uh, I was uh, at the Georgia Youth Fellowship yesterday. I, I was in charge of the game time. So Brother Butler said, Steve, could you handle the game time? I said, sure, I'll, I'll handle the game time. So I had these games, and in my head, they sounded great. I mean, we were going to get these marshmallows, and we were going to take them in our mouths, and we were going to spit them across the room. And then I got there, and I said, Brother Butler, I said, one of my main games is involving people like spitting. And I know we're in the corona world now, he says, don't worry about it. We're both a bunch of teens. We'll be all right. So I had a little bucket. I had some garbage bags set out there. And they start, they start spitting those out. And, and I called another group up. And I said, okay, we'll keep it simpler. We had, uh, we, we've played this with our youth group uh, many times. Is we get a stack of solo cups. And you change one of those colors. So they've got to take the top cup off. And then take the next cup off and put it on top of that. So you're making a tower from the original tower. And on the bottom is a different color. So then you get to that one, and, you do, and the first person wins. Easy and simple. And uh, I, I, one of the kids that came up, must have just come from baseball practice or a baseball game or whatever, he had a Yankees hoodie on. I was like, this is my kind of guy. Because I'm a Yankee fan. And I love the Yankees. I talk about the Yankees all the time. And even though they're bad, I still like to talk about them. And I enjoy talking about the Yankees as much as you guys probably that are into the Braves love to talk about the Braves. But I saw him and I said, you're a Yankee fan, aren't you? He said, no. <laughs> he must have been sad the Yankees have been losing lately too. And he did not want to claim that. But we don't like to lose. I remember growing up and... Uh, in the early 90s, when the Yan you thought the Yankees are bad now, but they, they were really bad in the 90s. They owned the last place probably for, the, for 10 years. And I remember tickets were so cheap, nobody would come to Yankee Stadium. You're talking about Yankee Stadium. I mean, they had Monument Park. They had all these great old baseball players like Babe Ruth, Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle. My dad had, a, had an old Little League uniform, and he said... Look at what was on the back of that, number seven. 
he said, I wore that because I loved Mickey Mantle. And he says, everybody wanted to wear that uniform. Everybody wanted to wear number seven, but I got that. I remember seeing that uniform. We wore it around, and we, we thought, man, this, this is pretty cool. I'm wearing Mickey Mantle's uniform. Mickey Mantle had nothing to do with it besides having the number seven. But that, that, was the, that was the number everybody wanted back in the day. I mean, you're talking about Yankee Stadium having this huge place where people would come, pay money to go and visit a plaque or look at a ball or look at a locker room. We, uh, we eventually did it the last year they had old Yankee Stadium. We were just passing through, of course, being in New Jersey. And, and I remember uh, Lisa and I, and it might have been Alex, uh, and we just went there. And I remember walking in the Yankees locker room. And the, the, the tour guide was pointing to different lockers. He said, see that locker? It's Mariana, Mariana Rivera's. See that locker? Derek Jeter's. And to you, maybe those names don't mean anything. But to me, those names mean something, especially knowing that I was around when the Yankees start winning some World Series. I was excited. You guys probably remember sometimes, maybe not your favorite team, but you remember a time when someone you were rooting for won. You say, I remember those days. You hope those days come again. I mean, college football is big down here in the South. I never realized college football was as big as it is in the South. When, until I went to Tennessee Temple, and I was in Chattanooga at, at Tennessee Temple, and they asked me, what college team do I cheer for? New Jersey, we had the University of, well, not even University, we had Rutgers University. They didn't win anything. I said, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I cheer for the New York Giants. I said, oh, that's nothing. And they didn't appreciate the NFL, but boy, they appreciated the SEC. They appreciated college football. Why? Because they always hoped their team would win. They always hoped that team is going to take us somewhere. Take you where? Nowhere, just because when the year's over, you go right back at it next year. You say, I hope my team wins. I hope my team wins. You know, you look at the Christian life, and I might be getting a little ahead of myself, but losing is not an option. But our problem comes when we feel that we've failed. And we have. Many a times we fail. We do things we shouldn't do. And God is, God is right there saying, hey, get right back up. God is right there saying, hey, it's, it's not necessarily okay, but... Press forward because forget those things that are behind. Move in the right direction. We can't do anything about those failures we've made of our lives. We might have a lot of regrets. Like I was mentioning that one individual that I was able to meet with a couple weeks ago. He had a lot of regrets. And I hated putting him on the spot about that. But once I saw his face, and once I realized who he was, I told him, I said, what you have found yourself involved in right now is not helping you get further on down the road. You realize where you've messed up. And he says, well, I, I was hoping that my family life would get fixed. And man, it doesn't look like it, it's, it, it's getting repaired as, as it should be. But he said, I have a hope that I can still get my life straight. I said, absolutely. And, Lisa, and, and I put it off on Lisa's dad, who was and is pastor in that church that he's going to now. And I said, I might not be around here, but this man right here can help you. This man can have meetings with you. This man can meet with you and open up the word of God with you. We had a good conversation about it. Is he a loser? If you're a Christian, you are not a loser. You are a winner. Why? Because it's all about what God did in our place, how God has used us. I want you to write this, uh, write this quote down in your paper. I think I've got room for it, if you can see it. This was the, the founder of Reformers Unanimous, Stephen Currington. He said this, The devil's desire from the beginning was to corrupt the relationship God enjoyed with his human creation. The devil's desire what the devil wanted to do right from the beginning was to corrupt the relationship God enjoyed with his human creation. Could you imagine going back to the Garden of Eden on that eighth day 
because God rested on the Sabbath. I, I often wonder, how long did it take for Adam and Eve to sin? I don't know. Uh, maybe someone who has done more studying on the Bible, I don't really see a time period. I, I, I happen to think it happened pretty quickly. But God created the world in six days. The Bible says on that seventh day he rested. And it goes right into chapter 2 talking about Adam and what Adam was to do and how God brought all these animals before Adam and how Adam was to name these animals. Adam was a smart guy. Adam was a guy that we should probably make plaques for because of the knowledge that he had and the expertise to say, okay, that's going to be a giraffe. Oh, that's going to be a cow. Oh, that's going to be a dog. I don't know how it happened. I don't, I don't, did he come up with the scientific names for these animals? I don't know how it, how it came, but we sit here today knowing what these animals are. God said, I had him name each of those animals. There was a relationship between God and Adam. And Adam had to answer to God for everything he did. But God always knew what Adam did. God always knew where Adam was, what he was doing, when he was doing, how he was doing it. God knew everything about him. There, there was no surprise to how God handled his relationship with Adam. But I can guarantee you this, just as Satan, the devil, Lucifer, decided one day, I'm not going to be faithful to this God that created me. Because God created the angels. The angels weren't, aren't beings that were around before God was. God had to create the angels. And at some point in time, and I hate to even say time because we realize it's in heaven, and, and God, God is, is giving the angels this opportunity to show their loyalty to him. And Lucifer takes a third of those angels with him. He says, we're not, we're not loyal to you. We're loyal to me. So it wasn't long after that that we realized that he's out there trying to tempt Adam, trying to get Adam to lose, trying to get Adam to give up on God. And even though Adam failed God, Adam was not a loser. Adam did not lose. Adam obeyed God eventually to the point that, okay, I've got to reap my consequences. And that was death, physical and spiritual death. Yet, he still started the world, if you will, with the generations and the generations and the generations. You follow that long line of lineage. I love watching the Bible prove itself. Uh, a couple years ago, I was able to, or last year, I was able to, to, to teach a little bit of Bible over at Creekside, and, and we were talking about some of the Old Testament uh, things in the Bible and going through some, some of, 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 the, of the time periods. And, and I brought up to, those, to those, uh, the eighth graders I was teaching at the time, I brought them just a graph of the years showing Adam lived 900, was it? 900 and something, I, I don't, I, 960, something like that, and he's, he lives that long. And then you find Seth is coming underneath him, and Seth is living so much, and you follow all these guys, and then you finally get down to who? Methuselah. And Methuselah lives all the way up to, and you watch it. You watch the, the Bible proves itself to the exact year. When Noah came and that flood came, and where's Methuselah then? When Methuselah died, God said, my judgment is coming. And that is what Methuselah's name means. I love when the Bible proves itself. But Adam, Adam was part of that. God had instituted Adam in the Garden of Eden. You say, why are you spending so much time on Adam? Because I want you, I want you to look at something and let's turn, let's turn it over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Adam is used all throughout the word of God in relation to, well, he messed up. 
Because you had that first Adam, Adam himself. And the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as that second Adam. And so you'll see on your notes you have two main points, and we'll, we'll get to those here uh, in just a second. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look down to verse number 45. First Corinthians 15, 45. And so it, was writ it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is, of, is the Lord from heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 to 47. And so many of us have memorized probably verse, starting in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, a, of an eye. We've memorized that. How many of us have realized, and doing, during this study, I'd never realized, wow. How God was leading right into that passage of scripture of the mystery. What a mystery it is to think Adam was created as a fleshly being. But did you notice that last phrase of verse 45? The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, an alive spirit, a made alive spirit. When Adam and Eve were in that garden and they committed that awful sin of eating the fruit, they plunged the entire entire human race into this thing of sin and the consequence that has come from sin and death and all these awful things and, and I think about losing my dad not too long ago and, and I've had to answer my brothers and we've had conversations about why, why would that take place and we all have family members and, and it doesn't, I don't think it ever ends I don't think it ever gets to the point where you'd say well, they were 95 years old. Why did God take them? They were healthy. They were ready. They were all full of life. Just recently, uh, and actually it'll be next week that the new pastor is, in, is, is instated into the church, and we're thankful for that. And we're, we're happy that, that it's someone that was under my dad's leadership, under my dad's tutelage, if you will, and just being able to learn under my dad and just get in, in there. He's evolved in the city, and he loves the city. He loves the people. And more than that, it's an, it was back when I was growing up, 85% Hispanic. Every Sunday school teacher was bilingual. Every bus worker was bilingual. My dad learned a little blurb that he would talk to people as he would knock on doors, and it would be a three or four minute spiel, all in Spanish. But he was hoping that nobody would respond to him in Spanish because he wouldn't know what they would say. He wouldn't know how to answer them. And, and, and so we've got, I just remember my dad and just be able to think, man, he was full of life. I was talking to him last week. And just like that, he's gone. How could that happen? And you just think, God, if it wasn't the way he died, he would have passed away some other way. But that was the moment that God said, thank you, Bill Garrick, for your life here on earth. I'm ready to take you home. Did he get to a point where he lost, he's done, he's finished? Fleshly, in his physical body, yes. But spiritually, absolutely not. Absolutely not. He is that in, in, in eternity now. I don't know how it is. I often wonder, boy, can, can he look down on us and say, yeah, keep on going, Steve. Keep on going, as my other brothers Bill and Dave. Keep on going. Keep pressing forward. I don't know, but I do know this that he's enjoying all that he worked for, and not necessarily worked for to get, but worked for the Lord and saying, this was worth it. It was worth it to push forward. Seeing our teens out there and seeing them up here and seeing them stand in the choir and seeing them and seeing them usher and, and play the piano and do different things, see them come to the GYFs and come to the activities. I tell them all the time, it's worth it to serve the Lord. It's worth it to keep pressing on. It's worth it 
to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The comparison in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 gives us two examples. And I want you to look at those in the amount of time we have remaining here. The first Adam. First Adam, I've, I've titled him, boy, he, he had an ineffective fight. He said, yeah, I got this one. I'm ready to go. He was knocked out the first round. I, I don't even know if time started by the time he made the decision to accept that fruit and to give into that sin. But the first Adam, we see him as having an, an ineffective fight. God's plan to battle the devil is to fight spiritual with spiritual. But what did Adam fight the devil with? Physical. How do we know that? Because as soon as he sinned, as soon as he realized the, spiritual, the spirituality of what he had just done, he went and hid himself. When he could have just acknowledged the sin for what it was and said, God, I messed up. But Satan offered that fruit, and in the physical, feeding that flesh, he said, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll use it. I'll have it. Living for the physical and living for the physical over and over and over again, like we often do, makes a person choose, a Christian choose, love God or love the world, as 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, for all that is in the world... Those, three thi those next th three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are not of the Father, but are of the world. So here's letter A. Are you satisfying the lust of the flesh? Are you satisfying the lust of the flesh? I want you to turn back with me to that account in Scripture in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says, And when the woman saw the tree that was good for food, I want you to note these three things here, because they will cor correlate with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one, ma one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. There are three things she did there. That first thing that she did was the tree was good for food. What was she doing? She was satisfying the flesh. She was satisfying the flesh. I came across a definition of the lust of the flesh it's a consuming desire. It's a consuming desire to do. A consuming desire to fulfill your, your, your wants, all the things that you want for your body. All that you want. We think of lust and say, oh, that is awful, that's sinful, that's a mind issue. The Bible talks about these three things, the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you even see them in the temptation of Jesus Christ. Not all the way here in Genesis chapter 3, but you see them in the temptation of Jesus Christ as well. The lust of the flesh is a temptation that is primarily, primarily directed against the mind. What we want to do. Not everything we do is wrong. But when we do it with a desire to fulfill our fleshly desires, that's when it crosses the line because something we shouldn't do. Is eating fruit, couldn't Adam and Eve eat fruit? Absolutely. But what, what fruit did they eat? My question was always, why are they around this tree to begin with? Why, why are they hanging around the place that they're being tempted to eat? Because it was, the Bible doesn't say the serpent well, let's look closer at it. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the serpent gave it to her. No, she took the fruit thereof. She's within reaching distance to this fruit. There were things that I did I shouldn't have done. And it's, it's funny to, to think about life and to think about after 
someone passes away and all the things you, you did that were just plain stupid. And I just rem- we, we live, all I remember is living in this parsonage of the church. And we had a long driveway. This driveway, uh, let's, let's just say, let's just say this right here, this center aisle is the driveway. The church, long church, because like I said, made up mostly, the length of it's made up mostly of this cathedral style church, uh, auditorium. And it's just fit on this postage stamp of a property. You know, everything's piled on top of each other in New Jersey, and especially northern Jersey. And so you, you have the church right there, and then where the church ends, this driveway wraps around to the main road, and so it kind of comes up on an L. Where, where, where you have to make the turn in that driveway, and you've got the parsonage over on this side, there's, I don't know, maybe, maybe between that... Probably the length between these two walls, the width between these two walls, we have a long driveway. We grew up playing, me and my brother, we grew up playing baseball. We had to figure out our own rules because it was me against him. We had nobody extra. We, we, it was an asphalt driveway, and we had bases, and then we had this, this tire that was against the garage, and that was our strike zone. So, I mean, we can get that. When we played wiffle ball, we'd get those We'd get that ball curving, and it, would, it wouldn't even hit a strike zone, but it hit the edge of that tire. You're out. And we'd have arguments. It didn't hit the tire. It hit the tire. I heard it hit the tire. Who's, and it was always the umpire was the fielder. The umpire was never the batter. He'd never call himself out. So the umpire was always the fielder. And as we would throw those balls in there, we, would, we just had a blast. And then we made it... We, it you know how you, uh, if you guys are familiar with arena soccer or arena football, you kind of play the sides, you play the walls, you play the whole area. We had arena baseball. And so we would, we could hit a ball, and when we played with the tennis ball, that was even better with an aluminum bat. We'd hit the side of a window, and hopefully it wouldn't crack, but it would just bounce off. And if it cleared the fence between the, the foul poles, it was a home run. So normally you'd say, oh, foul ball? No, you've got to wait for that ball to finish. You can't just call it. You've got to wait for it to ricochet. And I remember there, was, there, there, was, there were some times we broke some windows. There are still some stained glass windows that we broke in the front of my dad's property, in, in front of the parsonage, was an open area of grass. We had this grand idea we were going to hit pop flies just to help our fielding. And so we had a hard ball and a wooden bat. We said, we're going to pop it up. It was my turn to hit it. So I popped it. I was like, wow, that's a good one. And my brother's going over to catch the, catch the fly, and he ran out of room because there was the church steps. But right on the church porch was the, were these light fixtures made of nice stained glass. It shattered one of them. We said, what are we going to do? We looked at it, got up there, finagled it a little bit. We said, that thing spins. We spun it around. It had to be maybe a year or two later. My dad comes up to us and says, hey, fellas, uh, let, me show you, let me show you something. I'm trying to figure out how this, how this could have happened. But he walks us over there. It looks perfect. What, he says, look at that light fixture. And we're looking. It looks pretty good. We remembered. You never forget the sin that you committed. It, it, it stays with you. And he says, look on this end. And there it was shattered. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. R- remember? And all of a sudden, our memory came back. I think his memory came back that he became, he was the father in charge of discipline. He took care of that discipline. That, but there were so, so many things that you do in the flesh, trying to cover up your mess-ups. But... It never is worth trying to cover that up. So teens, young people, let me warn you. Just fess up right now. Your parents will know it happened, will know exactly how it happened. They'll put two and two together. You never get one over on your mom or your dad. Adam and Eve couldn't pull one over on God. Are we satisfying the lust of the flesh? Are we feeding into whatever that desire is? Losing is not an option. I'm never going to lose. But when I have that choice to do right or do wrong, which will I choose? 
Letter B, are you satisfying the lust of the eyes? Are you satisfying the lust of the eyes? The lust of the eyes is a compelling urge to have. The lust of the eyes is a compelling urge to have. Not only did Adam and Eve look at the, at the fruit for good for food, but it was pleasant to the eyes. They said, that looked pretty good. Compared to all the other trees, I wonder why that one looked extra special. Probably because they couldn't have it. You've been there? You're not supposed to touch that. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to be there. But you say, why not? I want to. I want that for myself. You know, being a parent, I realize, and it, hit, it hits home, it's so close to home because I remember some of the things that I did growing up. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get put in jail. I didn't do anything really, in, in comparison to a lot of my friends, I didn't do anything really awful. But I still did some bad things. And a lot of those things were just, why can't I do this, but my friend can do that? And my dad and mom's answer would always be, because we told you so. Well, that didn't work with me. Because I, I want to know why. But it didn't matter. Because my parents would always come back, children, obey your parents. And I know it's in the Bible. I know what the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Are we satisfying? the lust of the flesh? Are we satisfying the lust of our eyes, wanting what is good to the devil? And to the devil's, the devil wants us to follow that every single time. I want you to look one more time here. Are you satisfying the pride of life? You see that in that, in that verse as well. A tree to be desired to make one wise. A tree to be desired to make one wise. The, the pride of life is defined as a conceited drive to be. To be something, to be someone, to want something more than you have. The world has jumped on this and I believe they've attracted so many young people, I hate to say it, out of the church into the world because it's the newest technology. It's the newest thing out there. Whatever's on the market, you've got to have it. Why? What's wrong with the old one? Well, it still works, but it's not the newest thing. I want to have the newest thing. All the lights and all the bells and all the whistles, as we say, our young people don't understand that. And they'll learn that, that you don't always have to have what you want. You have what you need. God takes care of your needs. Adam and Eve were left in the garden, to t and their needs were taken care of. But they wanted something more than that. They failed God. God didn't say, okay, you're done. It was God that intervened and sacrificed that lamb, that sinless, innocent lamb said, because you committed the sin, this innocent animal had to die. This in innocent animal now you're clothed with. This innocent animal had to be set in a special place and lose his life so that you could gain yours. Adam and Eve, we could say it, were on their way to hell. Say, one of God's creations until God intervened and God said, I'll take care of this. I'll present, I'll present the sacrifice. And ultimately now, as, as we look back, we say, okay, it was looking forward to the land that would be slain from the foundation of the world. Genesis chapter two, verse 15. If you look back there, you see that God gave Adam a job to do, to dress and to keep the garden. And he was to to keep it up. But you know what? That was all before sin. Guess what Adam had to do now, after sin? He had to do it in the sweat of his brow. He had to, it was hard labor. It was, it was labor that was intense, that he would say, I don't deserve any of this. Yet he had to do it 
because God said that's part of the curse of sin. But was work a part of the curse of sin? I hate to tell us. Work was not part of the curse. Because he was dressing, he was keeping, he was working. He had a job to do. He didn't sit in a lazy boy chair. He didn't say, okay, animals, mow the yard. Okay, animals, you know, take, take care of that. I don't know, was he pruning? Th things were growing, I, I would assume. I don't know, I wasn't there. Maybe someone else has done some more study on that. You know exactly what he was doing as the Bible says, dress the garden. He was to keep the garden up. He was to watch over it. He was the caretaker of it. That wasn't part of sin. The sin, the consequence of sin was for him to then do it in a rough task type job. Won't that be great when we don't have to work hard? We'll have to work. We don't have to work hard when we get to see Jesus. I don't have time to go into the second Adam, but I do want to give you these points. It's, they're all found in Matthew chapter 4. But you see that Christ overcame each one of these. The second Adam, the completer, securing the win. I believe it was the week before Easter, pastor preached the message, it is finished. It is finished in the past, it's finished in the present, and it's finished in the future. There's nothing more that needed to be done. Adam and Eve messed it up. Did they lose? No. Did they fail? Yes. There are souls that are going to hell, but we're not maybe necessarily seeing them as, boy, they're lost souls going to hell. Isn't that how we separate the two? We have the saved and the lost. They're losing. We're not losing. But what are we doing to step in and to show the world losing doesn't have to be an option to you? I want, I want, you, to, I want you to listen to some of these things that the teens that were at the GYF told me they learned in the message yesterday. We had Scott Caudle, Dr. Scott Caudle preach, and he said, where are the laborers? Where are the laborers? And here's what some, some of our teens, I won't tell you which ones, but I, I believe God got a hold of some teens yesterday. One said, I felt called to surrender my life to Christ in response to the question, where are the laborers? That means something to me. It should mean something to you that a message hit home with one that said, I feel that call. I hear that call. Another said, I want to see the multitudes regarding missions and discipleship. Because Jesus had compassion because he saw the multitudes. The Bible says he saw the multitudes and then having compassion on them. Another said, to be moved with compassion as Christians, as Christ, at, be moved with compassion as Christ was. Be moved with compassion as Christ, follow the example of Christ. God is calling us, another said. We have to listen. God is calling us. We have to listen. That, hit home, that hits home to me. Another said, God moves us to help us. God moves us, works on our heart, that helps us. And another said, do you see the multitudes as Jesus saw the multitudes? So that you can help them, for it is. They are like sheep without a shepherd. I think every time our teens, our young people hear a passage of scripture, I believe it blesses their heart and it helps them and it points them in the right direction. So I, we saw our teens up here. Teens, stay faithful to the Lord. As, as we adults are being the examples to them, let us continue to be examples to them. Let us... Let us follow the Lord. Let us do what God would have us to do and show them losing is not an option. Would you bow your heads? Would you, would you close your eyes? I'm going to ask John and Brother Jim to come on up, and we'll have a time of offer, a uh, time of invitation. They're going to play a song called Jesus is Tenderly Calling. We know the words to that, 
but I just wonder. I wonder if Jesus is working on our heart a little bit more than he did yesterday. If he's not, why not? Have we gotten ourselves caught up into this idea of, well, is the Christian life really worth it? Look at the world around us. As John and Brother Jim begin to play, what's Jesus doing in your heart? What's Jesus doing for you? What's Jesus doing in your life? Maybe no decision needs to be made. You say, I'm just right where God wants me to be. I know I'm, I'm not there. I know I need God's help. I know I always have one step closer I need to be to the Lord. Who's Jesus calling tonight? They'll play it through it once or twice. Make your decision if you, if you do have that decision. We'll close here in just a few minutes.